Let's open our Bibles now, please, to the book of Luke, chapter 2. Luke, chapter 2. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem to see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. We have before us a story of uh, the most momentous occasion from the history of the world up to this point. I mean, this is a wonderful thing. God, the Creator, has come down to be with us. And He takes aboard Him a human body with a human soul, a human heart, a human spirit, and He's God in flesh. He's eternally God. He's still God. But he's also now man. He's God's perfect man and man's perfect God. And this one who is called the Word, capital Word in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. But that Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so we have before us God, the Creator, coming down and dwelling among us. What a momentous thing this is. This is the greatest thing that's ever happened in the history of the world up to this point. The greatest. And yet, consider with me the day after Christmas. The day after Christmas, The shepherds were still shepherding. The merchants were still selling, doing business. The bakers were still baking. The cooks were still cooking. The sinners were still sinning. What had changed? And we see the life of Jesus. We find his life. And this Son of God, who is the God man, walking in the world actually doing so many wonderful, wonderful miracles. Uh, we see him restoring sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf, making uh, the, the, uh, the deaf, to, the dumb to speak, and the lame to walk. And this one who has all power, who changed the water to wine, takes five loaves of bread and a few fish and feeds 5,000 men plus the women and children. This one who can still the winds and the waves with simply his voice in his hand, this one who could walk on the water, this one who could raise from the dead and restore to life, this one rejected by those he came to save. He came to his own and his own received him not. 
We see him rejected by the chief priests and elders and the rulers of the people, and they turn him over to the Roman government, and Pilate says, I find in him no fault at all, and yet I will scourge him, and because they demanded so, he had him crucified. This Jesus, who is the pure and spotless Son of God, without any sin whatsoever, pure in his birth, born of a virgin without the sinful nature, lived a perfect spotless life and spoke as no man ever spake. Even his enemies said, no man ever spoke like this man speaks. And this man, the mighty Savior, this man who's totally innocent, nailed with nails in his hands and in his feet, and on that cross bearing the sins of the whole world. Here was the Lamb of God, all of the lambs that were ever offered, all the blood that was ever shed could never completely wash sins away. But this man, because he's perfect and pure and spotless, it is said of him, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord God has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. He buried his body, our sins on the tree, that we being dead to sin and freed from sin to live under righteousness. Oh, think about it. This one who was bearing in his body our sins, who cried out after the darkness that covered the earth from noon to three o'clock, screamed out in a loud victorious verse, it is finished. It's finished. Sins is, our sins are paid for. The sacrifice is made. Salvation is freely offered now to the whole world. Oh, what a marvel. He is buried. And the third day comes out of that grave alive evermore. Amen. Has the keys of death and hell. And he is the mighty one. And he's, uh, after walking on the earth for 40 days, ascended back to glory. And now these wonderful things happen. The most amazing thing from creation to the cross. But what happens on the day after he's ascended? The shepherds are still shepherding. The merchants are still opening their stores and doing business. The bakers are still baking. The cooks are still cooking. The sinners are still sinning. The adulterers are still living in vile, wicked sins. Now the word of God is given to us in the words of Jesus, I'm going to go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. If where I am there, you may be also. We're looking forward to that wonderful time when he shall come, and we shall be caught away to meet him in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then on this earth, there'll be a time of terrible uh, tribulation and great judgments that such as never has been since the history of the world known or ever shall be. And then at the end of that seven years, Jesus comes and shout with glory and in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of Christ. Yes, he's coming again. And yet the promise is given and the scripture said the world lives on just as if nothing had ever happened. And they say, where is the promise of his coming? For all things continue on as they were from the foundation of the world. All things are the same. What of this? What of the birth of Jesus, the crucifixion of Jesus, the coming again of Jesus? Why does that not affect more people? The world goes on. And the answer to that question is a very important answer, and I want to give you that answer now. And that is this, that everything that God is doing with us is on a personal basis. You see, though he came and was the great I am, yet that doesn't affect you unless you personally receive him as your Savior. You see, he came to his own, his own received him not, but as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Amen. He said, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man will open the door, I will come into him, and will sup with him, and he with me. You see, salvation, though it's offered to the whole world freely, 
is only as good as that one person receives it. Now, the scripture said those who received Christ were born not of blood. That is, you can't be saved because your mama was a Christian or your daddy was a Christian or somebody in your family served the Lord. I was talking to a man one time. He said, well, my uncle was a preacher. <laughs> well, that's great. Now, let's get back to the point. What about you? You see, salvation is a very personal thing. Nobody can be saved for you. You must personally receive Christ as your Savior. You confess that you're a sinner. You can't save yourself. You can't cleanse your own heart. You can't take away the things you've done uh, even yesterday or this morning or on your way to church. You can't take away your sins. But there's one thing that can. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from all sin. And so personally, you come to him and you say, Lord, I am a sinner. I know I am, but I'm putting my faith in Jesus. I receive him into my life as my Savior and the Lord of my life. Oh, when you trust Jesus, then all that begins to make sense. And it really makes it all very personal. And you see, unless you receive him, he does you no good. His birth is useless to you unless you receive him as your Savior. Now, he goes a little further than that. In fact, when he tells us that we as individual Christians who have trusted him, that we're responsible for our lives also. Now, the question comes to me is this. We're in the last Sunday of, the new, of this year. We've got a new year in front of us. Will this time next year, if the Lord lets you live and the Lord Jesus hadn't come back, will this time next year find you a stronger Christian? Will it make you, uh, at the end of next year, will you say, boy, I have really grown in grace? Because the Scripture tells us, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it, it leaves that to a personal responsibility. Though we preach and teach Unless you personally receive it and apply it, it does no good. It's a personal thing. It is up to you to say, this, this new year is going to be different. I'm going to walk closer to God. This new year, I'm going to learn more of the scriptures. I'm going to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. This year, I'm going to learn more about prayer and spending time with the Lord and fellowshipping with Christ personally. You see, it's up to you. How will it be with you? Will you be a stronger Christian this time next year? Will you know more of the scriptures? Will you have had more experience with God? Will you have more prayers answered? Will your life be greater in the Lord than it is now? It's up to you. It's a personal thing. Oh, I, as, as your pastor, I wish I could do it for you. I, I would do it for you. I'd have everybody strong in the Lord and rejoicing in Christ and a victorious life and living as you ought to live and they're just rejoicing in Christ, but I can't do it for you. Your deacons can't do it for you. Your Bible teachers can't do it for you. It's a personal thing. How will it be with you? Will you be a better person this time next year? It'll be if you study the scriptures, if you learn more of the word, if you spend more time in prayer, if you talk to the Lord and fellowship with the Lord in your life day after day, if you make time, and by the way, we all have the same amount of time. Everybody has 168 hours a week. That's all you have. You can't get any more. And what you do with it is your responsibility. And can you make the time? Can you get up an hour earlier? Can you stay up an hour later? Can you take the time and dedicate yourself to learn the Scripture and spend time between you and your Savior? Just the two of you. That's where your strength comes. And then I think about the second coming of Christ and you know, for a child of God, the Scripture said when he comes, we are all going to stand before him and give account of our lives as Christians. 
Not that uh, we'll determine whether we're saved or not, but because we are saved, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of our lives as Christians. And did you know he said he's going to give rewards? And those rewards are going to be in the form of crowns? And he named some different crowns in the scriptures. And though the reason we have those crowns and the reason we want to be crowned is because we take those crowns and lay them at Jesus' feet as an eternal testimony of our love for him and our appreciation for his grace to us and the salvation we have in Christ. And we can lay that crown there and say, Lord, that says I love you and I thank you for saving my soul. We ought to all desire to have a crown to lay at Jesus' feet. But how shall we get a crown? There will be no crown without a cross. You see, he tells us we must take up our cross daily and follow him. And what that means is we have to die to self, to have in our own way. You see, we have a choice. And it's an individual choice. And the church can't win a crown for you. Your husband or wife can't win a crown for you. It is your responsibility before the Lord. And follow this. If you don't take up the cross and let him be Lord, there'll be no crown. You say, well, I know I ought to do it, but I'm going to do my way. You have your way. You're your own Lord. He's not the Lord then. Do you follow that? Do you understand that if he's the Lord, we do what he says? And yet so many of us have the point to say, you know, I like to do it my way. We're a little bit like uh, Frank Sinatra. I did it my way. Yeah, but that sure won't win a crown at the judgment seat. We've got to say, Lord, I want to do it your way. Mary said, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. You see, it's an individual thing. It's a personal thing. It's a personal thing in your matter of salvation. You receive Christ as your personal Savior. It's a personal thing in your growth in grace, in your walking with the Lord. And it's a personal thing about you winning a crown to lay at his feet. And that comes when he is Lord and not yourself. At Christmas time, I, I read again the poem that uh, you may remember by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. He said, I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. He wrote this in 1863, two years into the Civil War, when the nation was being torn apart. And he said, and thought how, as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men, till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day, a voice, a chime, a chant sublime, a peace on earth, goodwill to men. But then from each black cursed mouth the cannon thundered in the south, and with the sound the carols drowned of peace on earth, goodwill to men. It was as if an earthquake rent the hearthstones of a continent and made forlorn the households born of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. You know, that sounds like the world the day after the cross. Yeah. Sounds like the world the day after the birth of Christ, the day after Christmas. But because of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's personal faith in Christ, he wasn't, he wasn't finished. He writes... Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail. With peace on earth, good will of men. You know, the point is, 
Personal faith in Christ makes all the difference in the world. Let's bow for prayer. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I have a question. How is it with you?